dear students today we will be paraphrasing the poem to a skylark written by shelley in this poem shelley is greeting the skylark from a distance and calling it a spirit hail to the blit spirit bird thou never bird that from heaven or near it pours thy full heart in profuse strings of unpremeditated art shelly sees that it is not merely a bird but is it is something more than a bird which soars high up in the sky and he feels as if the bird is pouring its heart from heaven or somewhere near it the songs which it sings are plentiful and they are natural they are not artificial or cultivated higher still and higher from the earth thou springest the bird takes its flight from the earth and it soars higher and higher like a cloud of fire the blue deep thou wingest the bird flies in the blue sky and the moment is so swift just like a cloud of fire both the activities of flying that is soaring higher and higher and singing continue together in the golden lightning of the sunken sun over which clouds are brightening thou dost float and run the bird begins its flight early in the morning when the sun has not risen and the clouds are brightened up in the golden light the bird takes to its wings early in the morning like an unbodied joy whose rays is just bigger it its flight is compared to the birth of a new joy the pale purple even melts around thy flight in these lines the poet is describing the evening and he says that the atmosphere is covered in purple color as the night is approaching the bird is compared like a star of heaven in the broad daylight thou art unseen but yet i hear thy shrill delight just like the stars of heaven which are unseen during the daylight but we know that they are there in the sky similarly the bird is also unseen because it flies at such a great height but we feel it is there because we hear the shrill cry of the bird in the next lines the poet is again comparing the bird to the moon and he says keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere the songs of the bird are sharp and bright just as the rays of the moonlight whose intense lamp narrows in the white dawn clear but these rays of the moon they grow dimmer and dimmer and the fate because of the bright sunlight but we know that the moon is there in the sky so the lark is here again compared to moon who is not seen because it is high up in the sky but its presence is felt similarly the bird's music can be heard although it cannot be seen 
with our eyes all the earth and air with thy voice is loud the poet says that the shrill song of the lark fills the sky and the earth in the next lines the poet compares the song of the bird to the rays of the moon when night is bare from one lonely cloud the moon rains out her beams and heaven is overflowed the moon is covered by a single cloud but still we can see the bright rays of the sun flowing from behind it flooding the whole sky similarly the shrill sound the shrill music of the bird is overflowing in the sky what the what we know not what is most like thee the poet is not only thrilled by the delightful song but he is also filled with amazement as to what it is exactly like or what does it resemble the poet imagines that the rain drops which come when there is a rainbow in the sky beautiful to look at but the showers of melody is much more beautiful than the rain drops in the next stanza the poet is comparing the bird to a poet he says like a poet hidden in the light of thought singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought he is comparing it to a poet who is absorbed in his own thoughts and who is singing songs spontaneously till the world is moved to sympathize with those general hopes and fears of humanity which we did not heed before in the next lines again the poet is comparing the bird to a high born maiden or princess who lives in a palace tower he says like a high born maiden in a palace tower soothing her love laden soul in secret are the poet is comparing it to a princess who is living in the quiet palace consoling her love laden soul at the time of midnight when the rest of the world is asleep but the music is overflowing her room in the next stanza the poet compares the bird to a glow worm which is hidden but we come to know that it is there by the light which it emits like a glow worm golden in a dell of dew which is found in damp places scattering unbeholden its aerial hue unseen itself like the lark because it is among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view the golden worm is hidden by the flowers and the grass but we know that it is there because of the light which it emits like a rose embowered in its own green leaves the poet is again comparing it to a rose flower which is covered with green leaves but we know that the flower is there by the scent by the perfume which is spread by the breeze the scent it gives makes faint with too much sweet these heavy wind thieves so the breezes they steal the scent and make faint just like 
a man who eats too much and becomes rather lazy sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass rain awakened flowers all that ever was joyous and clear and fresh thy music doth surpass the poet says that the song of the bird is much more brighter and clearer than the showers of spring which fall on the grass and twinkle or the rain awakened flowers the flowers which are washed like the child's face so all these beautiful things when compared to the song of the bird they are not so much fresh or bright or clear as the song of the bird in these next stanzas the poet is giving a philosophical touch he is saying teach a spirit or bird what sweet thoughts are thine the poet asks the bird what is the source of its inspiration which inspires it to sing such beautiful songs i have never heard praise of love or wine that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine he says that love or wine are regarded as the source of inspiration but it cannot be the source which inspire the bird to sing as the songs which it sings are so divine and beautiful chorus hymnal or triumphal chant matched with thine would be all but an empty vaunt the poet further says that the wedding songs or the songs which are sung at the time of victory when compared with your songs would be all hollow meaningless and tuneless a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want these songs they cannot be called perfect because they lack something in it what objects are the fountains of thy happy strain again the poet asks what are the source of your inspiration which inspires you to sing such beautiful songs what fields or waves or mountains what shapes of sky or plain whether it is the field or the waves or the mountains or the shape of the sky or plain or the love of your men of your kind what is it which inspires you to sing what ignorance of pain or is it that you don't know what is pain you have not suffered any pain that is why you sing such beautiful songs with thy clear keen joyance languor cannot be the lark's joy is so pure and unmixed that the poet says that sorrow or depression you have not experienced never came near thee or you have not experienced any annoyance thou lovest but never knew love sad city you love you have loved but you have not experienced the sad state of love in which a man gets fed up with it waking or sleep thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream the poet says that either the lark has understood the true nature of death better than man because man is always afraid of death he is always thinking of death 
whether wake or asleep and that is why the birds songs flow in such a crystal stream because it is not afraid of death or it has understood death more better than men in the next lines the poet gives the sad lot of men he says that we look before and after and pine for what is not we look to the future with fear and we look to the past with regret and we pine we regret for what we do not have and that is why we live in our present and we don't enjoy it our sincere laughter with some pain is fraught even when we try to laugh it is filled or touched with some pain our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thoughts and poet says that those songs are considered most sweet which are inspired by some personal despair or frustration yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear if we were things mourn not to shed a tear the poet says that if we could scorn or if we could run away we could avoid hate pride and fear which are the causes of unhappiness shelley wants that every heart to be ruled by love or only then we could come near to the birds joy better than all measures of delightful sound better than all treasures the poet says that the songs of the bird are better than all the songs and tunes it is better than all the treasures of wisdom and philosophy that is found in books thy skill to poet were thy thou scorner of the crown the poet says that if it could only learn something from the bird it would also be happy as the bird soars so high the poet regards it as if it is running away from the miseries of the world in the last stanza the poet is trying to convey the message he says that teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know the poet says that if he could only learn something from the bird half the gladness if the bird could transmit to the heart of the poet he would write poems which would impress the people and they would listen to them spellbound just as i am listening now just as the poet is listening to the song of the bird people would also listen to what he wishes to convey as they are indifferent now thank you